I'll never forget my first dive in Monterey Bay where I sat on the bottom of the ocean breathing and I realized that this is what I wanted to spend my life doing, studying the world that lies below the surface and working to ensure these ecosystems had a voice. I was lucky to be accepted into graduate school at the University of Hawaii where I began studying the many ways that human activities degrade coral reefs. It was here that I gained an immense passion for all things seaweed, not only because of their important role in marine ecosystems as food and shelter for other organisms, but because of the potential that they have to help improve sustainability in many sectors across our planet. After finishing my graduate work in Hawaii, I landed my dream job as an assistant professor at Scripps Institution of Oceanography at UC San Diego, one of the best places on the planet to study marine science. Here, my students and I continue to study coral reefs, but we've also expanded to studying California's rocky intertidal and kelp forest ecosystems. I've spent most of my professional career over the last two decades studying how humans affect marine ecosystems. This work has taken me all over the planet to some of the most remote corners of the world where people have never lived, to some of the most heavily urbanized locales. Regardless of the location, or whether we're working in coral reefs or kelp forests or the rocky intertidal, the single thing that all of these ecosystems share in common is that they're under extreme threat due to the numerous impacts associated with the burning of fossil fuels. Global climate change, sea level rise, ocean acidification, these trends are all going to continue until we make a serious and drastic change in our society. While there are things that each of us can do in our day-to-day -day lives to reduce our carbon footprint, there's an urgent need to innovate new solutions that could have an impact on a much larger scale. Because of this, there's a lot of interest and momentum in looking at ways to reduce carbon dioxide emissions via the development of alternative energy, building of electric vehicles, use of biofuels, etc., even efforts into trying to capture and sequester the carbon that's already in our atmosphere. However, we generally hear less about the more potent greenhouse gas, methane. While less abundant in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide, methane is 25 times more potent in terms of its warming potential than CO2. However, the good thing about methane is that it only lasts in our atmosphere for about 12 years, as opposed to hundreds of years for CO2. This means that if we're able to get a handle on methane emissions now, we could actually see the results in our lifetime. So where do these methane emissions come from? Well, the majority of anthropogenic or human-derived methane emissions come from the livestock industry, and specifically from enteric fermentation. Yes, that means that ruminant animals, cows, sheep, goats, buffalo, they literally burp, not fart, out the methane equivalent of over three gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. The livestock industry as a whole emits an equivalent amount of greenhouse gases as the entire global transportation industry. With the increased interest in reducing greenhouse gas emissions globally and the Biden administration's laser focus on methane in particular, there will be more and more regulations, policies, and restrictions coming down the pipeline in the years to come. So how is it that we will meet these emissions reductions targets when no large-scale solutions exist? Will the meat and dairy industries need to be phased out in order to meet these targets? Back in 2018, I came across the research of some Australian scientists that had been experimenting with different types of seaweed and plant extracts to explore if and how the chemical compounds in these species might be able to affect the digestive process in livestock. These Australian scientists ended up discovering that one particular species of seaweed could generate a 95% reduction in methane produced by the bacteria that help with ruminant digestion. This was a groundbreaking finding. Fast forward a year and a group of scientists up at UC Davis conducted the first live animal feeding trial where they fed cows a small amount of the seaweed and saw remarkable findings. The patterns seen in the lab actually held in live animals. These results then began to draw attention from the media and a general sense of excitement began to emerge. Around the same time, I participated in the Global Climate Action Summit up in San Francisco, and I had a booth with one of my students to share with the global community all of the wonderful things that seaweed can do for our planet. Here we shared the story of the methane mitigating seaweed in livestock. I ended up meeting multi-generational farmers, owners of dairy companies, including some of the best organic dairies in the world, Strauss Creamery, and they all expressed great interest in this seaweed and indicated that if we could grow it, they would want it. This buzz got me incredibly excited, and from this point forward, I got goosebumps every time I talked about it. 
So now we just need enough of this particular seaweed, Asparagopsis taxiformis, to feed a billion cows. Simple solution, right? If we fed every cow on the planet a half a percent of their daily dry matter intake, Asparagopsis, that would be around 250 million pounds of dried seaweed needed per day. So is this possible? At this point, no. Um, no one had really ever attempted to grow the seaweed in captivity until just a few years ago. It had not been grown in the lab and certainly not at a commercial scale. We knew next to nothing about it from a scientific perspective. What we do know is that this beautiful red seaweed is generally found in tropical to subtropical locations worldwide. It turns out that Asparagopsis produces a unique suite of chemical compounds that essentially react with enzymes in ruminant animal stomachs. And this not only blocks methane formation, but it allows the animals to use more of their consumed food for metabolism, essentially making them more feed efficient. Great, win-win, methane reduction and feed efficiency. I assembled a team of students and researchers at Scripps along with collaborators from around the world, and we began our journey into unraveling the mysteries of this seaweed. I have to say it was with surprise and excitement when we conveniently found Asparagopsis literally growing in the aquarium facility right here in my lab at UC San Diego. We collected some and began our work. Isolating, purifying, and cultivating the species in captivity took months of trials and tribulations, successes and failures. There's still much to learn, and we're still improving our techniques and approaches today. We have now been successfully growing Asparagopsis at Scripps Institution of Oceanography for three years. My team and I have conducted countless experiments and explored different techniques for cultivation. We've spoken to numerous investors, media outlets, and beef and dairy cattle ranchers from around the world. We've even partnered with a startup company, Blue Ocean Barns, that is likely to be the first to market with this species in the coming year. It's a fascinating space to be working in, and one that of course has its skeptics. The main criticisms surround the scalability. Can we simply grow enough of this seaweed to have an impact? Right now, probably not. But in the next five to 10 years with investment and research, most likely. I always remind people that we did not commercialize wheat, corn, soybean, sugarcane, or rice overnight, or even in a year. These industries developed over centuries through scientific research, strain selection, selective breeding, and even now genetic modification. We can't expect the few research scientists that are working with the seaweed to miraculously develop commercialization strategies overnight. We are scrambling to find ways of growing the seaweed as fast as possible with the highest concentrations of bioactive compounds. We're working on strain selection to identify populations that are robust and disease and pest resistant. The development of this industry must be informed by science, and as such, we need to invest in the research needed to make it a reality. I think that most of us can agree climate change is a real problem, and the associated global impacts can be paralyzing to people who feel there's nothing they can do to make a difference. However, I believe we need to flip the narrative. We need to see these problems as opportunities. We need to encourage innovators, entrepreneurs to develop new clean tech, clean energy, and nature-based climate solutions. Who would have thought that a delicate red seaweed would hold the secret to making one of our most carbon intensive food systems on land more sustainable? This one solution has the potential to be a huge industry of its own, creating thousands of new jobs globally while massively cutting greenhouse gas emissions. I personally think this seaweed solution is going to be a huge player in helping us reach greenhouse gas emissions reductions put forth in the global Paris Climate Agreement. As a marine biologist who spent the last few decades watching the degradation of natural habitats due to climate change, I never thought that I could end up working on such an impactful solution, and an ocean-based solution at that. To think that one of my favorite species of seaweed could end up helping to ensure coral reefs, rocky intertidal, and kelp forest ecosystems are around for future generations motivates me every day. Now we just need to make it happen. We don't have centuries to figure this out. With my background and expertise and the unique facilities and resources available at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, we are eager to get this done. Ultimately, in order for this industry to succeed, it really must rely heavily on research and continued innovation. For this reason, it is critical that scientists, entrepreneurs, startups, philanthropists, and investors all work together to see this over the finish line. Please join me in helping to make this seaweed solution to global change become a reality.